Welcome back. Today we are talking all about puzzle books with my friend Keith Wheeler from over at Keith Wheeler Books. Keith Wheeler is a multi-award winning author, first published at the age of 14. Now since then he's published over 250 books in a variety of genres and niches. And Keith's self-publishing expertise has allowed him to help countless others achieve their lifelong goal of becoming published authors through his YouTube channel and his 30 day coaching program, many of whom have then gone on to become Amazon bestsellers themselves. Now Keith's publishing philosophy is simple. Everyone from seven to 107 has a book inside them waiting to come out and he loves to help them on that journey. Now Keith is an expert when it comes to producing profitable puzzle books through KDP. So he's going to be sharing a lot of that juicy knowledge with us today. So let's go ahead and dive in. If you're new here, my name is Rachel Harrison Sund, and I help people generate passive income selling journals, planners, notebooks, and more on the Kindle Direct publishing platform. If that sounds like something you're interested in, then subscribe to this channel and don't forget to hit the bell so that you can be notified every time I put out one of these videos, which is each and every Monday. All right. Hello, Keith. Thanks so much for joining me today. I feel like it's been a long time coming getting you on the channel. Um, Absolutely. Glad to be here. Yeah. So I think most people that are watching right now, they're probably already going to be familiar with your popular channel. But just in case there's a few people watching that aren't, why don't you just quickly tell us who you are and what you do? My name is Keith Wheeler. My channel is Keith Wheeler Books. On the channel, I cover low content, written books. Children's books are a big passion of mine. And so it, it's kind of like an eclectic type of a, type of channel. I try to make sure that I dis I disperse out the content so that way I'm not alienating any one group. But yeah, we have uh, just above 13,000 subscribers right now. So that's amazing. Really excited. Really excited. Awesome. So one of the things you talk about quite often are puzzle books. And yes. I want to know for the people watching out there, I've actually never published any puzzle books myself. So maybe you can tell me as well. Why should anyone that are publishing low content books consider adding puzzle books to their catalog? Absolutely. It's a great question. Low content books are consumables and puzzle books are as well. But where puzzle books are slightly different is they're single use consumables. So you may have a, you know, a line journal or a planner. And if someone really likes it after they purchase it and use it up, they can go and buy the exact same one. But you can't do that with a puzzle book. If someone buys my puzzle book and they like it, they can't go and buy that same puzzle book. They have to buy a similar one because they've already done those puzzles. Right. And so that's where it's a little bit different than regular low content books. And you can really, instead of, you know, you may have just one or two uh, notebooks or planners that really sell for you by having puzzle books, they kind of um, sell each other, you know, they, they cross promote each other. So. Right. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. So how long have you been publishing puzzle books and how many do you have in your own catalog? I've been publishing puzzle books for a little over a year now. I, I kind of just stumbled upon it uh, in one of the niches that I already had my art, other low content uh, books in. And so I was like, let me, let me try this. And it, and it went really well. And so right now I have just under probably a hundred different puzzle books in the different niches that I'm in. Wow. That's great. Have you created most of those from scratch or are you using some software? Um, it, it's a combination. You know, I, there are absolutely some really good software out there that I, that I do use and that I recommend, but there are others, other puzzle types that, and we'll get into that later, but there are other puzzle types that I do create myself. Okay, cool. So I think you mentioned brand names a second ago there, but just tell us, like, do you, do you recommend publishing all of your puzzle books under the same brand name, or do you recommend using different brand names depending on which kind of sub niche of puzzle you're in? So for example, if you're doing kids puzzle books versus adults, are you using different brand names there? Or for you personally, do you have it all under one brand name right now? I don't have it under one brand name. I really don't like to uh, reinvent the wheel. You know, I try to be as efficient with my time and, and efforts as possible. Mm -hmm. And so if, if it's a niche that I already have an established brand in, then I'm going to, I'm going to ride those curtails of that brand, you know? And so in some of the niches that I have puzzle books, then I will use that same brand name, whether it's you know Keith Wheeler, or if it's one of my pen names, but there are some instances where if I jump into a new niche, I will create a completely separate brand for my puzzle books. Okay, so cool. It really, it really just depends on, 
on, you know, what your plans are as a, as a low content or just the publishing books in general. The one thing that I will say, like, as far as adults versus the kids is if you have an established brand in, let's say an adult, some, you know, some adult niche, if it's a niche that kids would be interested in as well, instead of creating a new brand name for it, I would stick with that same brand name because now you have that brand loyalty from the adult. And if they see that you now have an activities book that junior can use, then you have a much better chance of getting that additional sale. Right. So you're just kind of leveraging sort of the brand recognition, I guess you'd call it that you already exactly. have. Exactly. Yeah. Brand loyalty. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So lots of different puzzle books out there, like different puzzle types. Do you find that certain types of puzzle books sell better than others? Like, you know, there's crosswords and word searches and all different types out there. Are some more hot sellers than others or? I mean, yeah, in general, I mean, you're going to get, you've got the word searches, the crosswords, the Sudoku, you know, the, you know, the big three that are, you know, everybody knows about and they're really hot, but because of that, they're super competitive. It's kind of like the equivalent of a line journal in no content publishing. Right. Yeah. Everybody has them, you know, everybody buys them, but everybody has them. And so, you know, there are other puzzle types that are just as searched for, but they're a lot less competitive. Things like uh, cryptograms, word scrambles, word matches, and Hashiwaka Kero, things like that, that where people will. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm like. Everybody, uh, yeah, lo- everybody loves that. that. <laughs> yeah, everybody loves it. But, um, but, you know, people will search for those. And so the search terms may be higher, n- maybe not as much as a word search, but the com- competition is a lot less. So, you know, you don't have to create the thousands and thousands like you would if you were doing just a line journal. Right. If you're doing one of the, you know, the, the lesser known, but still, still hot niches. Right. Okay. So yeah, let's talk about keyword research then for a second. So when you're approaching keyword research for your puzzle books, are you approaching it in the same way that you'd perform your research for other types of low content books? Like, is it, you know, is the gist of it kind of the same or are there different parameters that you're searching for or looking for with puzzle books in terms of like search volume competition? I mean, in general, the, it's pretty much the same whether you're doing written books, low content books, or puzzle books, but you you can have a little bit more leeway when it comes to the competition, when it mm. comes to puzzle books, because I, I actually compare puzzle books in some cases when it comes to competition, less like a regular low content book and more like a romance novel. Um, and, and I know that sounds weird, but bear with me. <laughs> yeah. um, so because puzzle books have that, you know, they're consumables, but they have that extra criteria of being, you know, only being able to use once. And also a lot of puzzle consumers, puzzle book consumers, they are very voracious, just like when, you know, when it comes to the romance genre. So as much as we all want that first page placement, you know, the top of the first page placement, we know that's, you know, the Holy grail. And that's the true, regardless of what type of book you're publishing. But with puzzle books, because, you know, they, they are, can only be consumed once for that particular consumer, just like with romance, eventually they're going to get through all the, the books on page one. So being no. page two, being page three can still be very beneficial and still get you consistent sales. Yeah, that kind of so, answers my next question. Like I was going to ask you if, it, if because they're so consumable, does competition matter as much? And it sounds like you're saying... Not really, because people like my dad was just a Sudoku addict. I mean, it it actually became an issue in my parents' marriage. Like my my mom had to put her foot down and be like, <laughs> no more Sudokus in the house because he'd be sitting there doing them in his armchair for like 10 hours straight and, you know, neglecting everything that needs to be yeah. done around the house. So, I, yeah, that, that makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, obviously, competition is important in whatever business you do. You know, I mean, the big high demand, low competition means, you know, more sales. But yeah, you, there's a little bit more leeway that you have with puzzle books because like I said, you've got those repeat customers because they, you know, they are usually very voracious when it comes to, to purchasing and, and using the, the puzzle books like, like, your, like your dad. <laughs> yeah. um, so, you know, so you have that. So you, you can be willing to go in a, a particular niche that's a little bit more competitive when it comes to puzzle books. Right. Okay, cool. When you're creating your puzzle books, do you like to sort of drill down and and focus on one particular puzzle per book? Or 
do you prefer to create books that have a variety of different puzzles or are you testing out both? And if you are, which ones do you find sell better? Yeah, I, I've, I've tested out both. Um, what I found in that sells better for me and, and just a little bit of background on me, I, I've been in the market research industry for over 20 years. And mm. so I, I pay attention to, to that kind of stuff. And I found variety books sell better. To me, the psychological reason behind it is, you know, just like when you're, when you're finding a niche for low content books, you know, you don't want to sell to everybody. You want to sell to the people in that particular niche. Mm -hmm. Um, But also, you know, that when you niche down, the number of consumers that'll be interested is going to be lower. If you do a book that's just word searches, for example, you're looking for someone who is into, let's just say tennis, into tennis and into word searches. Whereas if you do a variety, then you can have word searches in it. So you're still getting those people, but then you're also getting the people that like tennis and Sudoku, tennis and, you know, Hashi Wakakero or whatever. Um, (laughs) And uh, so, yeah, so you're kind of getting the benefits of both. You're niching it down as far as your theme, but you're still keeping it open to different puzzle types. Okay. So that's a good question then. So are you, do you create these variety books based on a theme? Like you mentioned tennis, would you create a tennis themed puzzle book and it's got a variety of different puzzles all themed around tennis? Like, do you ever play around with that? Yes, absolutely. I, I, I am a strong advocate of just like with low content books, you still want to have a theme that targets a certain niche because when you try to sell to everybody, you're really not selling to anybody. Right. And so the, the same is true with, with puzzle books. And so some people may ask, well, how do you take puzzle books and how do you make a theme around it? Obviously you've got the cover that's, you know, that's going to draw in the theme and that's what people are going to see first. But if you're doing word searches in your puzzle book, then they can be in the example for tennis, they could be tennis terms. You know, if you're doing word matches, again, they could be tennis terms. It could be something as simple as like, if you're doing number type puzzles like Sudoku, just having, you know, different vector gra- graphs, you know, across, you know, on the different pages and things like that. So there are different ways that you can bring the theme into the interior. Yeah. I imagine those make really great gifts too. You know, if you've got a tennis lover in your life or whatever the theme is, I mean, that would be a great gift idea, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So for your children's and your adults, do you kind of, is it kind of split half and half or do you, are you focusing more on one or the other? I focus, it's funny because I write children's books, but I focus more for my puzzle books on the adults. And the reason why is two main reasons. What what I find, and this comes from having four kids, you know, one is they've got a lot more distractions. I mean, as much as adults, we have a lot of distractions, but if we want to sit down and do a puzzle book, we can focus and do that puzzle book. Whereas kids, you know, they'll put it, you know, they'll start doing it and then they'll put it down and, and kind of move on. But the other issue is when a child is done with a puzzle book, or activity book, depending on what you're going to create, but pretty much the same, then they still have to have the parent go and actually buy the new one. Whereas if you're the adult, when you're done with your puzzle book, you can just go and buy another one. Like, you know, you're done with it. You want another one, you go do it yourself. So there's, there's a lot less barriers for you. Plus what I found, at least in my own experience from people I know that use puzzle books, they do consume it fairly quickly. So it's not like that book is going to sit there for, you know, six months before, you need a yeah. new one. Yeah. There's that urgency consist- when they're done. It's like, I need another exactly. one. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so I guess, do the adult ones just outsell the children's ones? Typically, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So let's talk about series for a minute. Most of my low content books I publish in a series, mainly so that I can use that extra field for some extra keywords. Right. Um, do you publish your puzzle books in a series? Is like, I do. do you have any strategy around that? Yeah, I do. Just like with my low content books, um, when I'm starting a new niche, what I'll do is I'll go in and I'll, I'll usually publish between three and five in a given niche. But then once they sell, even if it just sells, you know, one or two, I will definitely stretch that out to be either a 10 or a 20 book series. And usually just calling it volume one, volume two or whatever, because you kind of, like I alluded to earlier, they're cross promoting each other. And the great thing is unlike a, a written series, you don't have to start with volume one. You know, they might stumble upon your volume eight. Then when they're done with that and they like it, they're going to go and check out your other volumes. Yeah. Now you don't necessarily need a series, but there's some, some comfortability that comes with someone buying into a series. 
you know, if I've purchased your first one, I know what to expect. So there's this assumed continuity between right. the theme, you know, between the series, as opposed to, oh, well, here's another puzzle book by Keith. Yeah, it may be similar, but if you know it's in a series, you just have a little bit more comfort level. Yeah, I guess you're not kind of just going to Amazon and doing a, the search from scratch kind of thing. You're like, okay, I, I already know this is the one I want and I know where it is and there's 30 more in the series. So are you, like, if you're doing a themed one, are you stretching that theme across the whole series? Like, would you have 20, I'll just go back to the tennis example, like, would all of your 20 in a series, would those all be tennis themed or are you doing like a different theme for each one within a no, series? I I usually keep it within within that same theme. Um, I may tweak it a little bit more to to kind of stretch that theme. So you know, maybe tennis with cats or something like that. So, <laughs> so you, you kind of brought you know bringing in another sub niche. So people who may be interested in cats may find this book and then again, you know, be cross promoted with the other books in the series. But there's still just one general theme across the whole series. Right. Yeah, that's something that I've had a lot of success with. Is just combining like two different themes, kind of just that like mashup. So like you say, you're getting people that are interested in one, people that are interested in the other. And it's kind of like this cross pollination of, of interests. And exactly. uh, I've always, I've found that to really be a, a nice booster for me um, in terms of, you know, just what sells and what doesn't. Mm -hmm. So, okay. In terms of the length of your puzzle book, is there kind of like a sweet spot in terms of pages or like how many puzzles you include in each book? Yeah, there's my sweet spot is is a 108 pages. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. When it comes to KDP and most print on demand platforms, the 108 is that sweet spot where above that you actually start paying an extra penny for the production of it. So obviously you're not paying out of pocket, but it's coming from your from your profit. So the other thing is is I usually do 100 pages of the actual puzzles, and then I'll do like a title page, and then at the end there'll usually be seven to eight pages of an answer key for the puzzles right. that are in there that actually have answers. And so it usually comes around the, the 108. So are you doing like one puzzle per page? Yeah, I do one puzzle per page and I'll typically do about 10 different puzzle types within the book and then 10 pages per each puzzle type. So how long is it taking you to create one book? Cause to um, me, I'm thinking like, that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> I mean, but you've, you've done a hundred of them so far. So, I mean, I'm right. sure you've got it down to, you've been able to streamline your process quite a bit. Right. And and don't get me wrong. Majority of them are not all done manually. You know, I do use software for some of the puzzles and then the other puzzles that I do manually, those obviously take a little bit longer. I mean, I've had a puzzle book take me you know, 12, 24 hours to create. But the good thing is, is a lot of them, once, once you've got it created once the, the overall layout is already created. So that's yeah. where the most of the time consuming part is. And then you can just do, you know, the, the making it specific to each puzzle and that you can do a lot quicker. So, you know, it's, it's just kind of the setup. It takes a little bit longer. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing, you know, when I create planners, it's like when I do that initial template that might take me 15 hours, but right. once it's there, it's there. And it's just a matter of swapping things out and things exactly. Just, things move a lot quicker at that point. Right. Um, okay. So pricing strategy, do you have one? Like what, how are you coming up with prices? Um, the way and what are your price prices? <laughs> <laughs> the way I come up with my prices, it's very similar to the way I come up with my prices for my written books, my low content. I go and I look at the competition. I pick out the, the top 10 or 20 that are selling. That's the important part. And then I see what they're charging. And I want to make sure that I stay within that high, low range. Majority of my books are going to be about, they're going to be at the $8.99 price point. Yeah. Um, and majority of them are in black and white. So you don't have to deal with the whole color and stuff like that. It's also going to depend on your niche. I have some niches where my puzzle books are $14.95 and they're still selling. So it's going to depend mainly on the particular niche and what the consumers of that niche are used to paying and what they're expecting. That sounds like a pretty healthy profit margin there at <laughs> fourteen ninety nine. Yeah. So what, what's your royalty on on something like that then? Off the top of my head, I'd say probably about five, about five dollars. That's great. That's a that's a nice healthy royalty there. <laughs> so we've all heard about this eighty twenty principle, especially when it comes to low content books. I've noticed personally, you know, I've got that 
core 20% of books that are making 80% yeah. of the profits. Are you seeing that with your puzzle books or do you find that it's a little spread out a little bit more evenly or is it just like anything else? There's like some clear winners and some clear losers. And then, so, you know, that gray area, middle ground in yeah. between. Yeah. Well, when it comes to niches, I'd say it's the 80, 20 rule still applies. You know, you're going to have some, you know, some niches that they just don't pick up as much, but when it comes to the puzzles, the puzzle books that are within that given niche, it is more evenly spread out because like I said, they, they can't keep buying the same one, you right. know, so they're yeah. going to, they're going to, you know, once they buy one and they like it, they're going to buy the others. I also make sure that the puzzles, even though the puzzles are different within each book in a series, the puzzle types are different as well. So like I may have 20 different puzzle types that I'm working on for this series, but in each series there or in each book, there's 10 that aren't necessarily the same. So it's not the same 10 puzzle types in volume one as in volume two. Right. Okay. Interesting. So this is kind of a little bit more of a broader question here, but okay. according to Keith Wheeler, what is the secret to success when it comes to publishing puzzle books? So is it finding unique sub niches? Is it following trends? Is it ignoring trends? Is it publishing in higher volume? If there's one kind of like, tip you can give to people that maybe haven't got into puzzle books, but are thinking about it, what would you suggest? I would say your niche is probably one of the most important. And then just like with any other book, making sure you have a killer cover and a good quality interior. Um, I mean, those are probably the, the top three. I don't follow niches. I mean, I don't follow trends unless, you know, it just happens to fall into one of the niches I'm working in, but I don't, I'm not one of those who just goes on Google trends and just, you know, starts working. I don't do that because yeah. trends, trends die, you know, and I'd rather stick with things that are more evergreen. Yeah. I mean, some of my niches are, you know, they, they definitely have a hot season and a cold season, but they're still evergreen in that it'll be that same hot season next year. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Marketing. Do you, do you have a marketing strategy? Are you just publishing and kind of hoping for the best or do you have any, marketing uh strategies in play here um i i typically don't do the whole publish and pray um because <laughs> it really hasn't wor has, really hasn't worked that well for me <laughs> you know amazon ads i'll do those also with a lot of the puzzle books that i have they're in niches like i said before that i already have other types of books and whether they're written books or other low content books and so i'll have email lists that i'll also promote those puzzle books in as well um, mm. cannot underestimate the power of Amazon author central it's free and having a, a pen name or whatever brand you're doing your puzzle books under having all those puzzle books where, like I said, once they come in and they see the first one and they, they like it, they can just click on your name and see all your other puzzle books that you have. Yeah. It's, it's always surprising to me when, you know, there's just so many publishers out there that just, they're not taking advantage of author central. And, but like you said, it's yeah. like, it's your own little store on Amazon and it, yeah. it leads and it's free. people directly to all of your other books. And it's yeah. free. Like, you know, what more can you ask for? Okay. So author central uh, ads and then your email list. So are, are you nurturing that email list regularly? Like how often are you in contact with your email list? Typically, again, it depends on if it's one of those, you know, where it's seasonal um, but for the majority of them, I will send out an update once a month. Okay. You know? And are you noticing, like, are you kind of tracking whether or not, you know, you send out an email blast? Are you then looking at your sales and seeing that reflected in, you know, are you seeing an increase in sales? It's always tough with Amazon because you can't really track where your buyers are coming from. So that's outside of ads. It's all, you know, when you're doing social media or anything like that, or Facebook ads, it's so difficult because you can't actually find the data of where people are coming from, which is frustrating. Right. Right. I mean, you can, Amazon's not very helpful when it comes to that is true, but in most email platforms that you use, like I use MailChimp, you can track and see how many clicks on that particular link. Right. So though I can't assume that they're all purchases, I at least know how many are actually clicking on it and at least interested in it. And for the niches that I do that for, I get usually between 25. I mean, some may go as low as 10 if it's like the off season, but usually about 25 is click through rate is what I have. So that's, that's been pretty, pretty successful for me. Some are even higher uh, depending on what the content of my, like, cause I, I usually in my email, I'll make the content, I'll kind of sell what I'm, 
you know, what, what's new and what they can expect. And then I just, you know, give them a little thumbnail of the different images and then the link to check it out on Amazon. Yeah. I mean, for me, I think an email list is just so important for that repeat customer base, you know, having that group of people that have already proven that they're interested in what you have to offer them. And then, you know, building that relationship over time, I think is really, really valuable. Yeah. I put off creating an email list for so long just because it's like, I didn't know what to put in there. It's just more work. It feels but like a hassle. It does. It, it, but you know but, what? but it's, it's not it's, once, you, once you get into it's it, not. it's really it's not. not. You get used to it. It's just like, it's part of your, part of your routine, but it's the only way to make that Amazon customer, your customer. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. That's why I'm, I'm always personally yammering on about the email list. I think it's yeah. very underutilized, especially in low content publishing, but I think it can be one of your most important tools because Absolutely. like you mentioned it, it's free. I mean, once you get to a subscriber count of whatever, a few thousand, and then it's kind of like, well, that's a nice problem to have if suddenly right, you have to exactly. pay for your email list. Yeah. All right. So one thing I wanted to ask you, I, I watched your interview over on self-publishing with Dale mm-hmm. and you mentioned something about using a puzzle book as a marketing tool for authors. Now that was something that I've never heard of before and I thought was really cool. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. The question he had asked me was, you know, who is puzzle books for? I didn't want to sound, you know, really generic and say it's for everybody, but it really is because even people who quote unquote, just write books. You know, they're not into low content or no content or anything like that. Even if you're an author, a writer, you can still use puzzle books as kind of a gateway and and a companion book to your already existing content. If you write children's books, again, you can create an activity book that ties in there. But it ends up being almost like a lead magnet because people who may not know you, especially in a very competitive niche, that may not normally know you as, you know, a writer or, you know, that you create, you've got a brand for planners, you know, maybe they're the niche that you're in with your planners is pretty competitive and they, they haven't found you, but they're into puzzle books too. And they see this puzzle book. And then again, they click on Amazon author central after they loved it. And they see that, Oh, you've got planners too. And so it, it's something that it's an target audience that you wouldn't even have probably found you now can find you through this other, what I like to call a lead magnet. Right. Yeah. That's cool. That's a, that's a great point. I think we touched on that a little bit earlier, just kind of like leveraging sort of your own, your brand that you've already created uh, and making exactly. that work for you in different ways. So that's cool. You have created this fantastic course to help people create their own puzzle books from scratch. That's called puzzle book domination. Spent the last few days going through it and I was pretty blown away by <laughs> just the amount of puzzles that you cover in there. I had never heard of about two thirds of them. They just kind of kept coming and coming. And it it was, I was pretty blown away by that, but talk to me a little bit about puzzle book domination, why you created it and who it's for and what it includes. Well, on, on my channel, on my YouTube channel, I, I'm really known for doing tutorials. And so I had already done some tutorials on puzzle books, you know, word searches and things like that. And after a while, they've gotten fairly popular. And I said, you know, instead of me still, you know, keep doing it. And it's not about making money. It's if I gave out all this information, like all of the different puzzle types that are in here, it'd be like line journals. Everybody would have it. And so it would make it super competitive again, you know? And so I was like, you know what? Let me give people a tool that they can use that will give them the information that they need in a very tangible way. And there's not a lot of fluff when I do these, you know, these tutorials. And so I was like, but where they can still make money with these puzzle types, it's not going to be, you know, so overrun with people who are just publishing and publishing and publishing just to get as much stuff out there and, you know, hoping it sticks to the wall. So that's kind of the reason why I started doing, trust me, I put like hundreds, if not thousands of hours into creating this course. But yeah, I mean, it shows, I mean, I just want to ask you about, because there's so many different puzzle types in there. I mean, is this just stuff that you come across with your own research or are you a secret puzzle book fanatic yourself? <laughs> and, uh, you know, you just happen to know all these different, because like I said, I, there were most of them I'd never even heard of. Yeah. So I was like, wow, there's some really, really cool niches in here that I don't think anyone else is finding. So like, is this just stuff that you've come across with your own research? Yeah. I mean, it, it was research. It was a lot of these I came across once I decided that I was going to create the course. They're not necessarily ones that I just use on my own. It's called puzzle book domination. 
they're not all puzzles. So there's games in there and stuff like that that are still a lot of fun. And I mean, I've got puzzles that are originated in Japan. I've got games that origin originated in um, Lithuania, you know, like they're all over the world. And a lot of them weren't you know, paper pencil type games to begin with or, or puzzles, but I tweak them enough to where it works. All of these puzzles and games that I have in here are ones that I've researched. They're ones that I've actually, you know, made myself and more importantly, have actually sold. And so those, those were the three criteria that needed to be so that way they could fit in, into the actual course itself. Here's a question. Are you targeting other primary marketplaces for, like you said, you know, you got puzzles that originate in like Lithuania or Japan. Are you using that as a strategy to target a particular market other than the U S with some of these puzzle books? I, I haven't, honestly. Um, I, oh, I've got light bulbs could. going off now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as soon as you said that, as soon as you said that, yeah, I mean, I've thought of that, uh, but as of now, I mean, I have, I mean, other than, you know, doing an entire book on Hashis or, or something like that, but um, I, I'm more try to be again, more international and try not to minimize myself or, you know, limit my audience. But again, that's a great sub niche. You know, you can find, you know, certain ones that are more towards the West or the, you know, East hemisphere and, and more to target those. That's absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely I mean, viable that, that might be an idea for someone out there who's watching right now. That's a free, free tip right there. Yeah, exactly. Especially if you speak, uh, you know, one of the languages uh, of a country that where that puzzle comes from. And I don't know anyone who wants that yeah. idea, go ahead to go, go and go and run and with let, it. And let us know how it goes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so another thing I loved was the whole custom games thing. That's something that I, I hadn't thought about either. You know, you talk about custom games and how to create one, and then you go ahead and do that yourself. So that, I thought that was really neat. Do you often include custom games in your books? I do. Um, and at least, I mean, again, it's going to depend on the niche. I actually came up with that idea with uh, one of the main niches that I'm in. And uh, it's softball. I can, I can say it because if you Google it, my name, you'll find it anyway. Both my daughters have, were big in softball. So, I mean, I've got written books and no content books, low content books and puzzle books in, in that niche. I created a softball game that's custom. It's, it's something that only exists in my puzzle books. I mean, it comes with two dice that you cut out, one for offense, one for defense. And I show you how to do all that kind of stuff in the course. But I don't use softball as an example. Like that would be too easy, right? Because I've already done it. No, I, you actually, in the course, you see me find a niche and you see me create a game around it pretty much live. Yeah. And um, I did want to try to keep it as, as condensed as possible because I wanted to give you something actionable that you aren't spending hours and hours watching videos and then, and then do something with it. No, here's, here's what it is. Now go do something with it. Yeah, that I thought was really novel. I, I hadn't really seen that before. And I thought, you know, that right there is worth it to me to just get the light bulbs flickering as to like, okay, oh, custom games. And like, we all know, like the more unique that you can get with your content, the more valuable it is. And, you know, that's really what keeps people coming back for more. So, right. and, and within my series, um, you know, I may have 10 books in a series. I don't have that custom game in all 10. Some have it, some don't. And I do that because I don't want people to feel, oh, this is the same thing over and over again. That's something that is, is intentionally done. Like you said, having something unique really helps you stand out. And that's what makes it so that way they come back and, and purchase your stuff again. Because again, that's custom. They can't get that, that game anywhere else. Do you notice higher sales with those books? I do notice higher sales in those. More importantly, I notice higher book reviews. The reviews that are in there are not just you know, higher quantity, but the quality of the reviews are better. And people are actually mentioning that they love the, the unique games that are in there, the custom game that are created. So I have something tangible, you know, something I can read that tells me, Hey, you're on the right track. Yeah. I, I thought it was cool too. Like you had, you were talking just now about it, like actually cutting out a, like a dice. What's the plural? Is it the plural, plural is die and singular is dice. Nope, the other way around. Other way around. Okay, I don't yeah. want to like. So a sing a singular a singular die and multiple dice. Yeah, because um, I but yeah, you, but you know someone will pipe up about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought that was super cool that you actually had like pieces that you could cut out and and have something physical in your hand. I thought that was just awesome. I love that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, the key is to make sure there's nothing on the other side. Right. If, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I actually, and I actually mentioned that when I'm, when I talk about creating it and, and not just dice, but little chips, because some of the games that are in there are just like a chip, like, a, you know, that you would move around on the, on the board, on the game board. Um, so I'll show you how to make those. And, yeah. Yeah. You also had a cool bonus section. So you talked a little bit about like how to make your puzzle books more profitable. And you also dove into how to build a brand a little bit. So I thought that was just, right. that was great. I, I've really been enjoying your course. I haven't quite made it through yeah. all the different puzzles yet, but <laughs> my yeah. mind's definitely been blown there. It's a whole world that's been illuminated for me. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's quite a few in there. Um, right now there's 14 different puzzle and game types. And then, and I've broken them down into modules. And then each module has a quick video where I tell you, I kind of introduce you to the puzzle or game type and just tell you what it is and kind of how to play it. And then the next video is actually an over the shoulder tutorial where I show you how to make it. And then I include a PDF file. That's the instructions for the consumer that you literally could just download that PDF file as it is. You don't have to make any changes, but obviously you can feel free to, to tweak it if you, you know, if you tweak the game a little bit, but, but you don't have to. So I try to make it as clear cut and, and like I said before, actionable as possible. Like here's your instructions. You don't even have to create that. It's all ready made for you. Yeah, it was great. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, Keith, for everyone watching. If you're interested in getting your hands on puzzle book domination, the link is going to be down below in the description. You know, before we go though, tell us Keith, where can people find you if they want to learn a little bit more about what you're up to? Well, the place I'm the most active is going to be on YouTube. You can just go to Keith Wheeler books. You can also email me at kwheelerbooks at gmail.com and K Wheeler Books is my handle on pretty much every platform. So you can find me there. Awesome. I'll put all those links below as well. Thanks again for joining me and uh, we'll see you over on your channel. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. And if you'd like to find out more about how you can start generating passive income, selling journals, planners, notebooks, and more on the Kindle Direct publishing platform, then be sure to grab my free guide, Three Steps to Publishing Your First Low Content Book in Less Than a Day. I've left a link to that down in the description below. And also don't forget to come and check out my free Facebook group, Low Content Profits. I've left a link to that in the description below as well. Check out these videos next for more low content publishing tips. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe and share it with a friend. Thanks for watching.